Hey Heather, how are you doing? Good, thanks. Hi Hetty. Um, thanks so much for agreeing to be part of this virtual uh, lockdown talk series. Um, yeah, I think you'll add a really interesting perspective out of the group of women that I've been speaking to. Um, so yeah, how, like, have you had a busy day today? Yeah, just sort of um, packing bits and pieces, catching up with emails. Yeah. Good. <laughs> doing, the, doing the duties. I can imagine. Um, okay, well, first of all, uh, uh, if you just want to introduce yourself and your business and what kind of work that you do, um, like, yeah, let everyone know who you are. <laughs> um, I'm Heather Scott and I am mainly a furniture maker. Um, sometimes I pretend to be an architect or a builder occasionally, but um, but I'm like trained in furniture making in woodwork and metalwork. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I'm going to show off my technical skills here and share my screen. And I've just got your website here so we can kind of have a scroll through that. Um, and I don't know if, the, if you could pick any of these pieces out that are on your website and maybe just give us some further information about them. Um, so the plant hanger, this one, um, yeah. So that's one of my favourite um, pieces, just because it sort of combines my skills really in um, woodwork and metalwork and design. So like I try and be, I mean, I'm, these are all my designs, but in like projects, I always try and be involved in a design level as well. Um, and yeah, I le like learnt, learnt carpentry and then sort of went on to teach myself metalwork and it was sort of just really nice to be able to, like with things like that, being able to use six mil steel where wood would never do. So that was just, it was just quite a fun in terms of like my process, like being able, like learning a new skill and a new material and then being able to push my design stuff a whole lot which is then I went on to design the coffee table and the side table which is the same sort of thing you know like it's like you could those frames um are like four mil steel so being able to like play with those dimensions in, a, in another way was really fun and did you do that um like what was the kind of timeline of you creating those designs? Had you already established your own business by that point or were you working for someone else and in your free time kind of developing things? Um, I was sort of been working for myself for the last seven, eight years. So I take on odd projects for other people. Um, like sometimes I'd go and do other jobs, but primarily always working on my stuff. Um, so I started making the sort of smaller stuff that you see there, like the tableware stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like, so that was sort of like the starting points of my business. And then I went on to do more furniture um, in the sort of later years of it, I guess. Yeah, um, I'm just going to get my questions up. So um, could you just explain like how you got into woodwork? Um, I know that you did an apprenticeship and you did start university but just remind me and share with other people what was your kind of journey to where you are now um so i started off on a on a contemporary crafts degree and then and then after a year i decided it wasn't what i wanted to be doing um so i stopped and um then i was really fortunate in finding somebody who would take me on in a voluntary way um so I did a really informal sort of apprenticeship I guess um for a couple of years and worked on a build project with a really amazing carpenter Mark Harris and we rebuilt a or demolished and rebuilt a timber frame glass house and that project sort of covered everything from like quite early on to like structural stuff and then like I guess as my skills progressed the project progressed and we did more 
furniture and fitted it out like um with furniture and some other joinery like the doors and the windows and that sort of thing so it was like a really amazing project to be a part of because it covered a lot and it's surprisingly difficult to find people who are willing to take on somebody for free like it's a huge ask to like somebody sharing their time and knowledge even if you what you're offering is free time like mm. and free labor I think I was that was something that I was really surprised about is that it, that was really difficult so I was really lucky I think to find somebody who gave me that opportunity um because that was a real turning point I guess um and do, would you say that is it was just luck or did you approach him in a certain way say I don't know did you like really have to sell yourself or was it just kind of the right time the right place I can't, I can't really remember I approached I think I sort of approached a lot of people like that time I was like desperate to find volunteering opportunities because I just wanted to be learning stuff um and so I approached a lot of people to do different things and um and I think with it was the timing that was really lucky with that that I you know I approached him at a time when they would like when he like him and his partner Seth were like effectively going to like single-handedly take on that project and so they like felt like they couldn't turn down free hands mm. um so it was like yeah in that sense I think just very timely yeah um so so that you describe that as like a sort of informal apprenticeship so um you haven't have you completed any kind of qualification since or it's just purely no, learning on the job got any formal qualifications whatsoever but but then after that I like got a workshop with um at a place where there's like lots of other makers and at the time there were lots of people there working all the time and there was a lot of sharing of tools and knowledge and all those things so it was like that was a really really formative thing I think to like have lots of people who were um willing to share and um and as it progressed like it would be the sort of thing where if one of us had too much work there'd be people to take it on and if one of us didn't have any work somebody would be able to find them some work so it really worked as a like really positive community um so that felt that felt really great um and you know it was sort of acted as a bit of a sort of security um just in it took away a little bit of stress knowing that there were other people doing the same thing and also in Falmouth where I am based it's like really there are a lot of independent makers um doing all sorts of different things and so some of the people who have been really supportive even if just knowing that they're there are like other people sort of working in textiles or um you know like a, a friend who runs a company called frankly and another friend um diva who runs phaedra and they like they're both um they're both working in textiles but they are working in a really similar way um and so those people knowing that they're there um like other makers and artists like amy Alves freeman who's a really good friend of mine likes running their businesses in a really similar way and having that support network like amazing like completely irrelevant from you know not in terms of like sharing of skills but like in like our values of what we we're trying to do and just like a bunch of women knowing that there were like this bunch of women who were setting up their own businesses and doing the same thing like to be able to like go for an occasional drink or just know they exist like really that was a really helpful part in my business I think in in the sort of setting it up yeah yeah I realized my question may have sounded a bit like I care so much about academic qualifications or like but um I think it's just because a lot of people wanting to get into craft you kind of think oh where if I want to learn these skills um I don't know if you can hear that banging my neighbors are having some work done so <laughs> try and ignore it and um, I think it's like when you're a young person wanting to get into the industry or like learn those skills you obviously try to look for like these certain routes into education um 
but it sounds like yeah what because is it was it called Spargo the sort of farm mm -hmm. the, yeah. the all the workshops it just sounded as if like yeah everybody had come together and were kind of creating their own yeah ways of working and community and like I think in a way that that's probably much better because it's kind of you're learning within context and and I yeah. think it's like one of those things it's like remembering that there's options for doing things like dependent on the way that you learn like and for me I knew you know I knew that I wanted to be learning in a more focused way and from people who really knew what they were doing like not to say that people that teach at universities don't know what they're doing but like in a re you know they were, were directly in the field and and on a day-to-day -day basis like like passing on the skills that they were using daily um and that like for, for example my crafts course it was so broad it was like covered metals plastics um wood ceramics glass and so then I knew that I would come out of the end of it with a really broad range of skills um but not necessarily focused to what I wanted to do and and I and then I think I'm just a big believer in there being different ways of learning and but it does you know that's not what's readily it's not as easily available and I think a huge part of it is just having access to those opportunities and or even access to the like feeling like you can do that like that you can drop out of uni or that you can sort of like that's a really in even that mindset is a really fortunate mind space to be able to take on like um and i you know and that was part of a brilliant thing about living in cornwall like you know that's the the how much money you need to live is lower and my workshop was really cheap and all these things that were like they gave me the they i guess they gave me the things that meant that i could make those decisions and i could take those risks which is like an enormous privilege like but it also took me landing myself in the shit and being like i'm gonna you know make this move and um quit uni and i spent six months just not know what like absolutely not know what to do mm -hmm. um so it's like i don't know there's like so there's so much of it it's like there's so much that all feeds into the, those that like pathway of things um yeah and i think when you were going through that six month because this is a topic that i wanted to touch upon anyway about um going through sort of crisis and like maybe those periods of change or where you feel like less in control or like less folk like less clear on having like a pathway to follow um so it's like i would imagine that time when you dropped out of uni was probably that sort of situation um and like i think to, for me that's why i think studying a creative course is so important because when you're in those situations it's that kind of mentality of like what are my options how can i be creative in this situation like how can i be resourceful yeah. um and i suppose yeah um and then maybe like we i think everybody's kind of finding themselves in a similar situation now with covid so like i don't know um yeah i don't know have you how did you kind of move forward from dropping out of uni um and yeah well you spoke about how you um I feel like I'm going on a right tangent here. <laughs> um, you you met um, uh, at Spargo. You had like that really great group of other craftswomen. Um, how how did you go about actually like developing the business and kind of yeah? How did you go from like six months of not knowing what you were doing to actually setting up a business? What was the kind of structure there? Um, it, it was all um, a mess, really. Like. Um, I think there like definitely hasn't there hasn't been like a straight run of like this happened and this happened and this happened like I've taken on lots of different projects like there's been like at the beginning I was sort of just getting any furniture work I could um, 
so you know doing domestic stuff doing bits of site work doing like you know working for other people making their things and then I'd try and I I tried to sort of in between fill times when I didn't have work with developing my own range of stuff um and then and then slowly it shifted so that I was doing more of that stuff um like I was doing more of my own work and less of the domestic carpentry stuff um and and I think the point where it things started to turn a little bit was when I started saying no to things so people would say can you fit some shelves in my alcove and I'd be like mm, I need the money but I don't want to do that sort of work and the more I and I, I started noticing that the more I said yes to that sort of work that's how word of that's how my word of mouth work was coming so then you know you bump into someone in the street and they're like oh what are you up to at the moment and you're like oh I'm doing some you know making some furniture for somebody's house like some fitted furniture or something and then they go okay that's what she does and you know that, and then and especially in a sort of small community um and so I started trying to say no to things when I couldn't afford to say no to them like at that when it was making it difficult for me to like to say no and I guess as time's gone on I trust a little bit more um I trust a little bit more that the that the right things will that the gaps will get filled or in the gaps I'll have I'll um I know what to do a little bit more um but it's sort of like yeah it's been quite interesting like just in terms of like the response to the covid stuff um because I'm really used to the uncertainty so I lost an enormous amount of work but I'm I'm used to the uncertainty because I've spent the last seven years being self-employed. So I think, and I notice in friends who are, um, who are employed in, and always have been employed, the idea of being furloughed and not having time and, and friends who, uh, who, where their jobs are at risk is like really like incredibly unsettling um, because they've, they've worked really hard for the security, for the job security. So like, I found that quite an interesting thing that like, just, just through like going, like I always have those moments, like on such a re regular cycle of like, just being like, oh, I haven't got any work, what am I, you know, because I haven't planned ahead enough or things just have stopped coming through or it's the middle of winter and, you know nobody buys anything in January and like so I'm really used to those cycles so it's I don't have a like I think it's very easy to see an established business or what appears to be an established business like online and for that to be for it to be a given that they have a continuous stream of work because you know the reality is very different and I think the more sometimes the more f sort of I, I don't know it can just sort of all really appear really different um mm. and I think though it feels a bit like those times when they have don't have work come around a bit less but they still come around and I'm a little bit more resilient to them whereas before um and I give myself the time a little bit more like I don't feel like everything's failing um because i mean the amount of times where i've been this close to to packing it in is ridiculous like because those they you know it comes it just comes around all the time <laughs> like mm. it takes constant work and energy to keep a to like run your own business without any help <laughs> like and trying that because you can't keep up things always fall at the way so like you always forget to do a photo shoot or you don't have time to update your website or you you're like oh, I haven't designed anything new in a year like all these that, that I just physically can't keep up like because I'm a single human mm -hmm. so I think it's like I guess like I try and 
not be so hard on myself over the years um yeah do you think you finally come to a point now where you're like confident enough, enough or experienced enough to just sort of like relax into it a bit and like yeah those moments where you have felt like oh I just really need to pack this in what was it that like stopped you from doing that or pulled you out of it just sheer determination or <laughs> or any particular strategy I don't know I'm definitely pretty determined but I think also it's like uh, yeah like I've been less worried about you know if I need to take on work from other people or like letting things change direction a bit and not being so like holding on to one thing you know like and being like that's the thing I'm gonna do and if and being like, okay this doesn't work like that's fine there's a, there's parts of this that don't work which like on a small scale like might be with like a product that just never sells you know because it's like you know I haven't reached the right audience or it's like it takes too long to make so it's it becomes unaffordable you know like I don't know like I guess being less attached to things and I think like removing a sort of like um I think in the early years I cared so much about it like mm. and and I think actually the the really good turning point was when I started caring less about it um, and I, because I could remove myself a little bit and because it's like when it's your business and it's everything you do and I and I started to be able to see it as work a little bit more and that like it's driven by my passions it started by what I'm really passionate about and continues to be what I'm really passionate about but I can walk like I can go home at, I can walk away from it like and and I think that was a really helpful point for me where I could be like I guess like pull some of the emotion out of it <laughs> um yeah I've had a similar discussion with Nancy um in the first episode of the series about that about how much pleasure should we derive from our work and especially when like craft and furniture is such a lifestyle especially if you run your own business because it is quite all consuming um not that I'd know because I don't run my own business but I think yeah and so do you find that now that you're trying to sort of you talked about like kind of emotionally remove like detach yourself a little bit do you find like it's more important then to have like other hobbies and interests aside from design like how how have you tried to compartmentalize it um i guess that's for me that's really important um like it not being um everything i do um and yeah i definitely you know like yeah trying to be really strict with when when what hours i work so I never, I've never like been someone to do all nighters, and I've always really tried to not work weekends all the time and finish at a reasonable time, and like, um, because it like yeah becomes really consuming. But um, yeah, I've like recently been doing like some. I think also it's like making sure that you keep enjoying making stuff, and I think recently. Um, I've sort of lost a bit of that like really loving making stuff and I've been doing some projects making for other people and I've really loved I've really enjoyed being in the workshop and making stuff when it wasn't my work um and it was a bit of a light bulb moment in being like you know that it's taken so much of my energy that I've stopped enjoying the making processes and that that is really sad like then what's the point in running your own business you know it's like there's it's it sort of becomes a, you look you know it's like when you sort of feel so far from what from the beginning yeah and do you think you're always gonna stay as like a sole trader or do you think you have visions to employ other people and maybe like develop the brand to a point where yeah well do you, do you always want to stay 
stay making you don't ever want to become like a business owner sat in the office kind of thing I'm way more inclined to become employed than become an employer right okay (laughs) yeah um I yeah I I I think like yeah the idea of it becoming bigger and yeah is like it's just not a it's not it's never been an intention for me Mm -hmm. to like um to sort of employ people and and have a bigger business than than what it is yeah well so I think that's quite good that you kind of know that because I can imagine there's a lot of people who like just sort of bumble along and then there's so much work that they feel like oh I have to employ someone in order to keep up whereas I think if you and then and then I've heard quite a lot of um you know people maybe in their like 50s or so you've got kids and got mortgages and like that at that level of like running a business and they feel like they can't leave it because Mm -hmm. and then they're not on the bench anymore they're like a manager and Mm -hmm. yeah it's a very different kind of job isn't it or circumstance um the I've been loving seeing pictures of the cab um the cabin that you the a-frame cabin I can try and quickly find a picture of that to share with people. Uh, is it on your website? No. Uh, I think it's, it is on your Instagram though, isn't it? Um, yeah. So very quickly. Um, yeah, could you like just explain how that project came about while I quickly find it? Here it is. Um, so that is a project that's been in the pipeline for years. It's been in the sort of... Um, pipeline of my brain for a lot of years it's just a project I've always wanted to do I've always wanted to build um an a-frame cabin and um I got commissioned to do it by an old friend and which is sort of again like such an incredible opportunity to be sort of I feel feel like it's one of those jobs that will is the best thing I have done and will ever do like you know it was so exciting to be able to have complete creative freedom um and is that built on their land then or yeah 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 um and so in this instagram post you've you've mentioned that you were um uh given some exposure in field mag um do you one of my questions was going to be about like how much exposure do you get and do you feel like there needs to be better representation of like women in woodwork or just independent makers I feel like there's a lot of lazy journalism out there (laughs) there's like an enormous amount of lazy journalism um which like I get quite shocked by like a lot of like copy and pasting and adding like I have to quite often find something and then I have to ch- chase up something that they've never been in contact with they've just written some stuff that isn't true so that feels like next level lazy journalism you know when it's like you don't get in contact with the person who's in the content and you also means that I have to do the work you like it feels mad but field mag was they were the opposite and they were really interested and you could tell that they'd really taken time to write questions that were fit into the project um and like ended up just having a really nice conversation outside of the article about like you know inspire you know my inspiration and things that they'd seen before and so it was ended up being a really lovely thing um i don't understand the world of um journalism so I don't know where um yeah I've spent a lot of time trying to sort of crack it I guess um but like yeah it's a world I just don't understand um but you I mean you've obviously you've been running your business for did you say seven to eight years is that right Mm. um And it is a lot of that just from word of mouth. Um, and then I guess through like, you know, social media now, how, how have you yeah. been able to build the brand? Um, exhibitions. Um, 
doing exhibitions, which has felt like a bit of a rite of passage, but I, again, it's, I just don't understand. And I'm not sure how any of that stuff works and whether it works. Um, because I, I always found that they took more energy than they gave anything back. Like, um, so yeah, I don't really know how, like, you know, how that stuff, I guess, you know, it's, I think there's a lot of um, just stabbing in the dark <laughs> and hoping that something works. Like, yeah, but also there's, there's, I think a lot of the journalism stuff is like, you know, like I can, like that article in Field Mag is probably like, it's like one of the nicest pieces that's been written. Um, and in terms of like the, you know, the reach and stuff, really brilliant. But nothing, you know, it's not like I get, in, there's, there's no, been no direct like contact from anybody from that. So it's like, you know, it's all a mystery. It's all a total mystery. And then things like Etsy will come up trumps, you know, mm. and you think, and and so it's yeah is I that how I'm, you sell sorry say that again um i feel like i've just sort of covered a lot of bases in that sense like so it's really difficult to to know what what works and what doesn't and i try and ask people where they've heard about me or come across me and sort of rarely get a get an easy answer that sort of makes sense it always related to something you might put work into or yeah yeah I guess that's the sort of the age-old thing of marketing like obviously the more budget you put into your marketing or the more you do it's just going to be better isn't it you, you don't necessarily know what's going to work every time but yeah um well do you, so do you sell a lot of your like homewares stuff through Etsy um and like, do you sell bigger bits of furniture through Etsy as well? Or? Yeah, and through, I'm not on the high street, and on my website, through my website. Um, so it's like a mixture. Yeah, a, a real mix. Because um, I'm not on the high street. Is that you, they have to select you, don't, it, it's quite sort of, like, not exclusive, but it's curated to an extent. Yeah, so they sort of, that was something that, came out of an exhibition they, I did an exhibition and they saw me at an exhibition um and then and then invited me to be part of not on the high street um but with all these things it's so irregular you know I'll have a week where I sell those of things and a week where I sell nothing like so it's all really you know it's difficult to quantify difficult to like make sense of really mm. Um, I spoke to Maria Gomez um, just earlier this week and we were just kind of reminiscing that you guys did Hot House together because I realised mm -hmm. there was a connection within all these women I was interviewing um, and I remembered the uh, exhibition that came out of the Hot House cohort I, d I think there was like a select few of you that did it um, and yeah I just wonder like how because maybe it's just me projecting, but like I find some of the scenes within the making scene quite exclusive or just like intimidating. And that I'm not that exhibition wasn't, but it was in a gallery in London, I think in like Mayfair or somewhere quite upmarket. <laughs> and I, I just think um, there's certain scenes within the industry or um, that I just find a bit off-putting and I don't know if you've had any experiences like that yeah I've sort of stopped doing exhibitions because of that reason I think um that I found that like do I it felt like a world I didn't necessarily want to engage with um and that a lot of the sort of exhibitions I did that like I would the things that would come out of it would be meeting other makers um, and that that was the positive thing um, and like with the crafts council course that was such a the hot house course it was such an amazing thing like meeting the other makers but I think the I think the design world in a sense of like the shiny Londonness mm. um, maybe that's just being 
in Cornwall for too long. <laughs> but like, I, I just, I, I find the whole thing intimidating. Um, and also that it requires a lot of money. And like, and that I, it's like, I can't, I can't reach it because I, ha I can't invest loads of money and stuff. So for me doing, you know, having us as an independent maker, like having a stand at London Design Fair is a huge thing. And then you go to London Design Fair and it's about getting you in there. Like it's about getting your stall money, but then there's no, feels like there's no celebration of the makers themselves. Like, and those, all those people themselves, whereas doing smaller markets, the, the whole, they're, they're set up by individuals, like often like set up by individuals and they're set up with the maker in mind because it's the people are like, look at these people, like they're all making amazing things and they should be celebrated. Like, and it feels like, that you're being provided a platform, which is amazing. Um, which I think is maybe, also, you know, like Bobby Tracy, I think does that. Um, that's sort of the only bigger exhibition that I've found has been really celebratory of the makers themselves. But yeah, I think, I don't know. It's a, yeah, it's a funny thing. And I think it's, it's again, it's that like, you know, losing the, what it is you really want out of it and it's like I was putting all this time and energy and money into doing exhibitions in London and I was like this isn't what I, this isn't what I started doing this for like mm. um and then the proportion of time the proportion of time that I'd be in the workshop making stuff compared to um doing marketing things or doing exhibitions or you know or writing emails became ridiculous which is something that like now I'm trying to change more and be like I just want to be making stuff more um have yeah. you have you identified like who your typical kind of audience are and who are the people that typical typically buy your work um I feel like I've really got no idea which is terrible but <laughs> When you sell things online, you quite, you know. Like internationally or mostly to the UK? Uh, both, but mostly in the UK. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's then really hard to engage with your, but it's also like, I, it's, again, it's a skill set I don't have, you know, finding that out and um, working, working out that marketing stuff. Um, yeah, but that was a good, that was a really good thing that came out of doing markets and exhibitions is having that contact with people. And mm -hmm. so I try and do like, I, I try and do a Christmas market locally um, every year, just for that reason. So that I can have some like engagement with the public, which is exhausting and quite stressful sometimes. <laughs> but like, um, but it's really good to be reminded about what people like and that they're that really tactile things I make are really tactile and that you you know you can have you know all this stuff and things that people are really drawn to one thing and not at all drawn to something else which is always a really interesting process just in like just clocking people's reaction mm. um which is really you know it's not I don't know it's good to be reminded of that in a sort of crazy social media sense that's like you don't get that from uh, like what does 50 likes mean you know but yeah, you know yeah. like you know a few comments from people at a market it's like like they'll always be you know at this Christmas market I do there'll always be one or two people that come up to me and they they just get it like their style and the like they really relate to it and and it's like that's all that I need is like for some for somebody else to really see it on a similar level. And other you know people will really appreciate it in lots of different ways. But sometimes people just see it on really similar level to me, and we have a really nice little engagement. And that's that's like 
sort of worth three days of um, sit, setting up a stool and, and talking to strangers for six hours every day. Yeah. So yeah. I think um, those moments are like I get them from yeah from doing like markets or kind of showing work and meeting people face to face but also through other little interactions and I think for me they're like the things that I have to hold on to and whenever I'm like doubting myself or like feel like oh what's the point it's kind of like those little interactions are like the thing that makes it worth it mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah and I yeah I, you mentioned right at the beginning of the conversation about knowing um like frankly craftware and amy Els freeman and and is it phaedra how do you how do you pronounce that phaedra. Phaedra. Yeah. yeah i do follow her on instagram and i really love her clothes it, yeah love it um but like yeah you like it's it's funny how i follow all of those accounts and i'm just like oh they're like who i kind of look up to and just think they're so cool like you're all just doing your thing and then it's kind of no surprise that you're actually all part of the same scene and know each other um yeah i don't really know if there's a question coming out of this but uh i just think it's really great and like i th like to other kind of young women watching this video how much do you think like your success or just like your perseverance in doing what you do is dependent on those kind of friendships and that kind of support network? I would be in a very different place, I think, without, yeah. I think especially in the sort of earlier years of it, yeah, other women doing uh, doing a similar thing. Because I don't see other women making, like doing woodwork. There's not that like, um, so having a support network, um, having that sort of support network was like enormous. Yeah, definitely really, really important. Mm. Um, yeah, it's funny. It's funny when you sort of lay it out and you go, oh yeah, <laughs> like, um, I think there's so much to unpick as to like, and what we were kind of saying before about like um, exhibitions and if those kind of big scale events are kind of off putting to certain people like, you know, you or I, then I, I don't know how many times I go to like those kind of contemporary craft shows for furniture. I mean, I haven't gone recently because I've kind of become a bit disenfranchised by it all, but like, yeah, it's just not a very female focused scene and also like I feel like a lot of my conversations are get wrapped up in the whole gender thing but but it's like it's not just that though it's just all diversity just it's like so male pale and stale <laughs> um, yeah. yeah I did it and um I remember last year I did a project called creative clinic with um, Didcot Girls School and I remember you commenting on one of the photos on Instagram or online somewhere just saying like yeah this is great and then it was like that like you know how you were just explaining like at a market if somebody came up to you and said they got your work I remember like your comment just being like this is great was like that version for me because it was just like yeah, oh, yes. it again. like and it's really important yeah like completely but I'm, and I think that's like yeah, what I've really noticed in the things that you're doing is like, it, it's it's taking on a lot, like, and it's taking on stuff that I really believe in, like, and that I'm not brave enough to do, you know? So it's like, because it's a really challenging, it's a, you know, it's a really challenging subject, like, um, and I think that's, it's something that I've, backed away from I think because I think there was a point where I was like I really want other women to see that this is a possibility like and but it's a hard job like it's a hard job to take on that of like you know um challenging such a 
such a norm that like there's so few women working in the industry like um and it sort of became too much for me to think about I was like I actually just need to sort of keep my head down for a bit and like yeah like I've you know a lot of social media stuff I've like really backed away from and things just because it's like it's a really it's over it's really overwhelming like it is really overwhelming um but I think it's sort of like remembering that there's something happening quietly um which so it's like for me with people like Alice Blog uh she's like one of those people who I just know quite quietly getting on with her thing like and it's really important for me to know that she's doing that like um and yeah funnily enough she was actually the first person I was due to interview um and then because of childcare issues we, we've had to like reschedule but I didn't even realize she'd had a baby so I was just like yeah. how the hell did you have time to have a kid right. and right. keep doing everything you're doing like yeah. phenomenal yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah completely. but I, th yeah. I think that's really that's a really good point though of like um how did you phrase it like people quietly just getting on I spoke to my teacher at college about this. She was like, like her actions are feminist. So she doesn't need to be like out shouting, singing from the rooftops because like her just being herself is like a feminist act because she does all these things. And I think my kind of, I think I've come to the realization that I probably wouldn't be able to run my own business and do what you're doing. But I think I have a skill set where I can like try and, just be like look at Heather Scott look what she's doing and look at Alice's blog look what she's doing like I think I just really like chatting to people and kind of you know I feel like I get inspiration from what you're doing I don't know whether I could like emotionally or mentally pull it off but I think it, it's all about it's teamwork like isn't everybody it? Everybody sort of taking their own path with it and being like yeah and even if that affects a really small handful of people, um, it like has a real importance. And even I think about it with, you know, the, the, like some amazing, you know, most of the people who have workshops, and my workshop is uh, men, and they're all wonderful. And, and I, like, it's a nice thought to just know that even in that very small handful of people, it might have normalised women doing woodwork and metalwork a little bit more for them. So that if they meet another woman who's doing the same thing, they won't go, oh, so you make everything. You do the making as well. Or what, you know what I mean? They might approach them differently, ask different questions, assume that they're more capable. Like, and so it's like, it has its, you know, that's a, a very small thing but that that might be I don't know it has its own influence like because those people will then talk to you know I don't know the way that they interact and go through the world with will be you know it will be affect them in some way so it's, yeah, yeah there'll be like a ripple effect to you, you yeah. yeah um so I feel like we've got maybe I don't know, maybe five, ten minutes left. I don't want to take up too much of your afternoon. Um, so, um, yeah, like in light of COVID, and it sounds as if actually you've just kind of powered through and adapted, and that's the way that you are. Um, but do you think you've kind of taken anything from the whole experience of 2020? And do you think you'll try and like... Have you, will you make any changes or try and sustain any of the changes that you've made? Yeah, I think I'll probably make some quite significant changes. Um, yeah, I want to be making more and I think I feel less attached to sort of keeping hold of my own business and like more inclined to work with other people. Um, because that's a, that's been a big thing, I think. Like just have it, like taking it, you know, always taking taking the hit, um, and 
that I really, I think that's part of what is the, you know, part of the biggest challenge I think for me is doing it all by myself. Um, so I really would like to sort, to find ways to like work with other people um, and just to be able to share a load and enjoy making stuff more. Um, and and just that, gen, uh, I don't know, I just feel like generally the work of two people makes three people's work um, because it's a more enjoyable work because the load is shared and um, you can bounce ideas off each other and it just sort of all goes like this rather than being stumped all the time by your own sort of questioning of things. Mm. Um, so I think that's what I'd like... Uh, that's like yeah feel, that feels like a big change for me yeah and have you is that kind of it's just been a realization as of yet or have you actually started to do well I think you did mention you're you you're starting to act in more of a freelance way like taking on making jobs for other people so it's my understanding of that is that like you get a set of drawings and you just make for that client you're not necessarily involved in the designing is that um, right? I've been doing yeah bits of I've been doing sort of all sorts really um, and over the last year taking on more making work um, like working with other furniture makers and like over the lockdown period I have been designing a range of furniture for like another company which has been a really nice collaboration because it's been like it's just been really fun having a different brief and um, not designing for myself and um, sort of having different parameters to work with so that's been a really yeah so it's just sort of I guess sort of just staying open to stuff really but that's I've sort of always done that with I really have appreciated that in running my own business is being able to change direction and like move things having sort of a consistent thing running through but being able to change direction along the course of it, I guess. Hmm. And and then like final question to sort of round things up. Um, what and actually I think it does lead on quite well from what you've just said. Like, what should be the future of this girl makes, and what do you feel like the community needs? Because it's got there's like a kind of brand, there's like a general kind of vision, but like I don't know where do you kind of where would you think the benefit could could be put if that doesn't make sense but yeah <laughs> um I think just from my perspective of what's like feels really important to me and looking back of where I think I would have been helped is as a like in school knowing about just knowing that things were options so like knowing that, uh, an that there were different ways of um, learning stuff that you didn't have to go like you know that there was like there was more than like vocational college courses and university and um, sort of traditional apprenticeships but also that those things were valued as equal and not like that if you were academic in any way then you should go to university and um, study something academic um, if you were you know in a background that supported that and encouraged that like and that yeah and I think that that for me is yeah it feels like a big thing you know being able to for like young people and young for young people to know that there's other education like other ways of learning stuff and for young women to know that they can do stuff if they want to mm. but I think it's like providing I think the opportunities have to come so early for them to have significance like um I don't know yeah like those seeds being planted early <laughs> like just, yeah. the, just so that I don't know a 12 year old girl might see somebody making stuff and and be like, I could do that, whether or not she wants to or not, is, a, is her own thing. But like, 
that it would even be an option that could could even be a possibility um because i'm just i think the more i do it the more i get used to the fact that there aren't any other like there's so few women in the furniture making world and then like you know i've sort of gone to visit workshops recently and it's like and there'll be you know like a workshop of 15 people and they're all men you know and you just yeah. think oh oh yeah and i remember you know and i'm like because usually i'll be bringing away on my own so i don't think about that stuff or i don't see it or i don't notice it i'm just like i'm just getting on with my job um and but it's like i just get reminded all the time when i go to a hardware shop and they're like you know having a bit of chat and they're like what are you what are you doing that you're using this for and oh, <laughs> oh i'm just gonna make and they're like what do you do and i'm like oh, i'm a furniture maker and they're like so do you make everything ah oh, the classic and, like, and you're like and it's those questions that are like they come out of a like you know they don't come out of a bad place but mm-hmm. it's like it's like i don't think that a male carpenter would come across that being questioned just being asked the question of whether it is the job that you say you do you do actually do like when you think about it that's mental like that doesn't make any sense somebody's just told you what job they do and you just ask them whether they do the job that they've just told you that they do like and you and sometimes i just want to turn around and be like do you think i'm a liar (laughs) <laughs> is this what they think about <laughs> like uh, you know like I don't know you know it's like I just want to joke about it and be like but it's like you know it's just it's quite incredible and I just think it would be really lovely <laughs> if that ha- you know if there's like, <laughs> like, yeah but yeah. I think um I think humor is probably the best way of dealing with those situations and I definitely don't don't do that all the time but I think like yeah when I got a job out of uni was coming up against that a lot and it just is so tiring whereas if you can kind of make light of the situation and try and see that other people are coming at it not just from a place of ignorance not from a malicious place it's kind of like you don't burn the bridges as much yeah Um, but But that's totally a case of like how you know like sometimes I'm Sometimes I can like handle, you know, like I can just, like I sort of can enjoy the comedy and the banter of it. And other times I'm like, oh, I'm really tired of this. <laughs> like I'm tired yeah. and, I'm and I have no energy left for making a joke for it. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I'm, it's trying to, I remember trying to explain that to somebody and they just didn't quite get it. It's kind of like, you know, when you're tired and you just like, can't be bothered with stuff. And then it's like, you have to deal with even more stuff just because you look a certain way. Um, but another thing about, um, just maybe last point, cause I don't want to take too much time, but, um, the whole thing about like women getting into furniture making, it's like, it's not just for a job. I think like, like boys young you know like groups of boys when they're teenagers have loads of hobbies because boys are always encouraged to do stuff and always feel like they have the confidence to do things so like DJing or like skating or like you know just yeah tinkering around with stuff and making things whereas like to girls it's like we're only ever encouraged to like put on makeup and like buy clothes and uh we're like you know in certain circles so it's kind of like if a girl just wants to like make something she doesn't even have to be any good at it or like do it as a job I think it should just be an option which is Mm. what you very you said very well just then so just wanted to reinforce that point (laughs) (laughs) um but yeah I think I I know you're busy woman you've got a lot going on so I'll maybe we I don't know if you've got any final points you want to add or no it was just real nice to chat to you and yeah it's great that you're doing this this series yeah oh thank you um it's really nice just makes sort of nice to bring all those connections together yeah i think that is it's just helping a lot to be like oh i'm not just stuck in my bedroom like there's other great people 
doing great things and I don't just have to take what's around me as face value so thank you so much Heather for being involved um it's been really great chatting to you so take care bye, bye. bye.